So last time we were in the middle of proving the, the, the sequential formulation of continuity. Now u be a subset of r and f be a function defined on u and p be a point in u. Then this function f is continuous at that point p if and only if for every sequence of elements of the domain u, which converge to p as well as that f evaluated at that sequence converges to r. So this is from last time still. So. Yeah, not one not the stuff was I think. Um, and we proved half of that theorem, right? It's an if and only if, so you need to prove both directions. We proved one. We proved that if f happens to be continuous at p, then for every sequence xn of elements of u, if xn converges to p, then f of xn converges to f. We still need to prove the contours. So. Um, let's think about what the converse says. The converse, well, says the same thing as on that previous page with, with the arrow going the other way. By the principle of contraposition, instead you can prove not f is continuous at p. It implies not for every sequence xn of elements of u if xn converges to be then f of xn converges to p. Everyone's with me in terms of the logic so far? So I'm going to prove that instead. Because it's an equivalent statement. So let's see, a function not being continuous at p, that's like a negative statement. So let's try to translate it, that into something that we can walk with. Um, so let's see, again, I'll do this off to the side. So let's see, not being continuous at p. Well, that means not for every epsilon bigger than 0 there exists a delta bigger than zero, such that for all x in u, if absolute value of x minus p is less than delta, then absolute value of f of x minus f of p <coughs> is less than epsilon. Uh, and now let's just remind ourselves how you negate statements. So not for every epsilon bigger than zero some stuff happens. <coughs> that must mean there exists some epsilon bigger than zero for which that stuff does not happen. There must be a counterexample. So this becomes there exists an epsilon bigger than zero such that not there exists a delta. There does not exist a delta. So that must mean for every delta, the stuff to the right of that line must be false, such that for every delta bigger than 0, there exists an x in the domain u, such that. Um, and then what's the negation of an if then? p and not q. p and not q, where p is the hypothesis and q is the conclusion. So not an if then means that it must be that the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. So it must be that this is true. Absolute value of x minus p is less than delta. And the conclusion is false. f of x minus f of p is bigger than or equal to epsilon. How do people feel about their logical calculus? People feel okay about that? Okay. So, f is not continuous at p by negating the conclusion of the theorem. Oh, I'm doing things out of order. Since f is not continuous at p, we get that conclusion. We get that there exists an epsilon bigger than zero such that for every delta bigger than zero, there exists an x in the domain u such that absolute value of x minus p is less than delta and f of x minus f of p is bigger than or equal to epsilon. So that's what we get out of the hypothesis that f of x f is not. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So in general, like, I like this room because it has a chalkboard. But I guess from the point of view of using the dot cam so much, it's really annoying that it's so far this way. I think in between the semesters, the whole room migrated forward. I think last semester I could see that better. Maybe my eyes are just going. 
OK. So now let's check out what we get to assume. We get to assume not for every sequence of elements of u. If that sequence converges to p, then f of that sequence converges to f of p. That's also really easy to negate. So here's what we need to prove then. We need to prove that there exists a sequence xn of elements of u such that xn converges to p and f of xn does not converge to f of p. That makes sense is the thing we need to prove. Yeah. So let's try to do it. So here's the game. Let's consider this very epsilon that we get out of the failure of continuity. I know something is true for absolutely every delta bigger than zero, and I, I want to build a sequence. Well, so I'm going to build my sequence xn. Well, this rule says that for every choice of delta, I get a choice of x. So let's take a sequence worth of deltas. Each of those will give us a choice of x. It's a sequence worth of x's, such that this happens. Does that make sense? So let's actually do it now. So let's. Consider the epsilon in, in, in this, this epsilon. That's a positive number. Let's let delta n be 1 over n. That's my favorite sequence that converges to 0. You can replace that with your favorite sequence that converges to 0, other than the sequence that's identically 0, I guess. It has to be positive. Sequence of positive numbers that converges to 0. According to item 3, we see that there exists some xn in u, such that this conclusion happens, such that the absolute value of xn minus p is less than delta n, which by definition right now is 1 over n, and f of xn minus f of p is bigger than or equal to epsilon. Everyone with me that that's the conclusion we get? So now let's just try to see if we achieve our goal. Um, so this xn, we just produced a sequence. And let's look at what we want to show. Is this a sequence of elements of u? Mm -hmm. Is it clear that this sequence converges to the point p in question? Mm -hmm. Is it clear that f of xn does not converge to f of p? Mm -hmm. So in some sense, you already believe the result won't help. Let's just say a few more words that mm -hmm. Right, I mean, you're right, it, it should all be clear, but that, it's clear because you know how to prove it. So let's see, since xn is in u for every n, since xn is in u for every n, we see that this is a sequence of elements of u exactly as we need. Since xn minus p is less than delta n, which is 1 over n, and the sequence 1 over n converges to 0. xn minus p must converge to 0. And so xn converges to p. And that was really fast, but you all already agreed that this was obvious. So I think it's OK to go fast. Additionally, we have that for every n in the natural numbers, f of xn minus f of p is bigger than or equal to epsilon, so that in particular, f of xn does not converge to f of p. It might converge somewhere else, or it might just not converge. But it definitely does not converge to f of p. And so what have we done? We have now produced a sequence of elements of u such that xn converges to p, and yet f of xn does not converge to f of p. And so we see that the does not converge to f of p. And so we see that the statement that <coughs> not f is continuous at p implies not for every sequence xn of elements of u. I don't know why I even put that close parentheses there. I should just remove that from the document. For every sequence xn of elements of u uh, 
if xn converges to p, then f of xn converges to f of p. And so, by the principle of contraposition, we see that this statement must imply that statement. So, if for every sequence, xn of elements of u, if xn converges to p, then <coughs> f of xn converges to f of p, implies f is continuous at p, which is the other half of the theorem we and so what does this, this say? This says that if you want to prove something about continuity, you can prove that thing about continuity by translating over to the world of sequences and proving some claim about sequences. And in fact, as an application of that idea, we showed that, well, you can use the fact that you know what limits of sequences do under like division to prove that a quotient of two continuous functions is continuous. That was like page one of these notes, page two. How do people feel about this? So the idea that this packet gives is that we can, we're looking at things about functions, we can use sequences to determine that. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why someone would choose to look at the sequence so, other than the function path? Um, here's something that we'll do later on in this class. Um, how many of you guys know what the intermediate value of the arm says? It says that if you have a function, continuous function on some domain a comma b, such that f of a is less than some number m and f of b is bigger than some that same number m, then there exists a solution to f of x equal to m. Yeah. Okay. Here is a way of proving that theorem. Um, and I'll draw it on the board, and I'll be super informal about it because the goal of today isn't proving that theorem. So let's suppose you happen to know that f of a is less than m is less than f of b. You would like to exhibit some number c for which f of c is equal to m. It goes from less than m to bigger than m. Well, here I'll make a false guess. Um, in fact, I'll make like three false guesses. Let's say. Uh, Let's call that point. No, I'm just going to make two guesses. A1 is going to be A. A2, B1 is going to be B. Do either of those solve the equation f of x equal to m? No, of course not. So, um, but the intermediate value theorem says that there should be a number in between which does. What's a number in between A and B? Let's take, I don't know, C1 to be A plus B over 2. What are the chances that F of that number is equal to M? Small, right? Yeah. Um, but if it's not equal to M, then either F of C is bigger than M or it's less than M. Let's say it's bigger than M. Then the intermediate value theorem says that there should be a point in there. Do you think you could keep on doing this infinitely many times? Would that give you a sequence? Yes. Does it look like that sequence would probably maybe be Cauchy and so convergent? I think so. So it would have a limit. That limit would be a point in the domain. So the function would have to be continuous at that limit. So you would construct a sequence. I don't know. Let's call it Cn. This convergent sequence. And you would prove a few things. You would prove that f of c n converges to m. But that would mean that f evaluated at the limit of c n would have to be equal to m by the stuff we just proved. 
So translating over to the world of sequences lets you do everything that we've done with sequences. We've done a few of these binary sources to like find limit points, uh, find subsequential limit points. You can do it now for functions. And the other application we did at the beginning of class last time when we introduced these theorems is we said everything you know about sequences, you now know about functions. So since you know that, I don't know, that one. Sequences, limits of sequences add under addition. You can use that to prove that limits of functions add under addition. Because what can you do? You can take any sequence xn of elements of the domain. You know that f of xn will converge to L. You know that g of xn will converge to m. So f of xn plus g of xn must converge to L plus m. But by the theorem that well, we haven't proven the same theorem, but about limits instead of continuity, you get that the limit of f of x plus g of x is L plus m. So everything you know about sequences, you can use to prove something about uh, functions. Um, how many people have looked at the homework from last time yet? Yeah, I have it printed out. But okay. One of the things that you will prove is the squeeze theorem by using exactly this technique. You'll prove the squeeze theorem for limits of functions by translating everything to sequences, realizing, oh, I've already proven the squeeze theorem for sequences, and then translating back to functions. So that was, that was maybe like a lot of watts, but does that follow about, does that give you enough reason to care about these results? Yeah. So, with 20 minutes remaining, um, let's start something which now is definitely going to be a multi-data. Let's talk about the topology of the real um, And I know that there's a significant overlap. Um, how many people in this class are, are taking are taking the Blitzer topology class? Okay, cool. So what you study in point set topology is uh, not a notion of like measuring distance by computing a numeric distance between two points. You measure proximity of objects in a space you think by thinking about open sets. Um, and so we'll, we'll introduce some of those same laws here. And so in fact, I'll do something that might be contrary to the way the, the point set topology class goes, in that I'll start by introducing the concept of a... Yeah? Are we... You might already said this, but are we not finishing the other notepacket? No, why not? Okay. So maybe I'll tell you what's in the remainder of that notepacket <laughs> again. The remainder of that notepacket is going to you on the which is that same continuity result, but for limits of functions instead. Okay. It's the same proof again. If you have time, do you think maybe you could do like a video of that too? Like within the next week or so? Then, uh, if I can yeah. steal the time, I'll try to. If, yeah, it, don't worry about it if you don't. Um, yeah, I can try to do that. Okay. Uh, in some sense, like it, it's, it really is the same proof again. Okay. So if you look at l last time's lecture, did actually successfully work hard and is now online. Um, so you, you can check that out if you, if you want to. Um, let's talk about closed sets. So we've seen already that limit points of sets are really important from the point of view of analysis. Limit points of sets are where you can talk about continuity. They're where you can talk about limits of functions. So let's just recall that, even though it's, well, it was on the board. And you already know it. Let's let u be a subset of r and p be a point in r. And then p is a limit point of view if for every delta neighborhood of p, for every delta bigger than 0, there exists some point in that domain u such that x is different from p and the distance between x and p is less than delta. So those points are, are important enough. Um, well, I guess one reason to care about those points is like they're, they're the points where continuity and limits tell you the same thing. If you happen to have a continuous uh, a, a function kind on some set and a point in that set, then p is a limit point if and only if 
So I'll call a set closed if every limit point of C is an element of C. So maybe it's worth thinking about some examples, and we'll just think intuitively right now. Um, yeah, let's be explicit. Uh, the open interval from 0 to 1, what do you think? Is that a closed set? No. Why not? Is zero a limit point of that set? Yeah. Is zero in that set? So this set, there exists a limit point of the set that's not in the set. So zero is a limit point, but is not in the open interval from zero to one. So zero, one is not closed. Um, what if I go ahead and replace that instead with the closed interval from 0 to 1? What do you think? Should that be closed now? Um, I think so. Yeah, and in fact, we'll prove that. Um, what if I take the, open in the closed interval from 0 to 1 and add a single isolated point right there? Is that now closed? Yeah, I think so. So I didn't manage to trick anyone. Is every point of that set a limit point of the set? No. No, but that's not what closedness means. Closedness doesn't care about the existence of isolated points. Those are just fine. Um, and in fact, that closed interval had better be closed because the whole point of closed sets is there should be a generalization of a closed interval. And in fact, let's, let's actually prove something. Let's prove that the closed interval from negative infinity to A and the closed interval from A onto infinity, both of those are closed as sets. Uh, and in fact, I'm only going to prove one of them, but in order to demonstrate that you can prove it for either of them, I'll let you prove it. So pick which one we, we do. Uh, how many people want plus infinity? How many people want minus infinity? I think the plus is that. So consider any A and R. We will prove only that the closed interval from A to infinity is closed. In order to do so, we have to prove that every limit point of the interval from A to infinity is an element of A to infinity. All right, that's what it means to be closed. So how will we do that? Well, let's let P be any limit point of the closed interval from A to infinity. Since we know P is a limit point of A to infinity, we know something. And what does it mean to be a limit point? Of P, there exists a U such that 0 is less than absolute U minus P is less than P. Yeah, instead of U, I said X, but that's just because I'm constrained by the fact that I pre-typed the notes and I call the variable x in the next line. Oh, oh but yeah, the set big U is also not defined. As you pointed out, that element x must be in the interval from a to infinity. We know something about that number x. What's the definition of things? What, what does it mean for a thing to be in the interval from a to infinity? It's less than infinity with greater than infinity. Yeah. Uh, and less than infinity doesn't mean anything. Right. Um, so you don't need to write that. So let's combine the two inequalities we have. Right now we have a is less than or equal to x. And I'll actually ignore the 0 is less than for now. Absolute value of, yeah, x minus p is less than, or strictly less than, delta. 
Let's use those to try to get a lower bound on P. It would be an upper bound if we wanted to prove the, the other plan. Apparently. It's too late to change your vote now. Um, let's see, I think I gave myself space to do so on the next page. <laughs> nope. So let's try to combine those two to get some bounding information on P. I guess let's start with that. Um, if you take that inequality and solve it for P, what do you get? Since absolute value of x minus p is less than delta, what can you tell me about p? It's less than delta plus. That's true. I mean, but you guys are being like timid enough that let's go through all the walk. All right, whenever you see an absolute value is less than, that's equivalent to the thing inside the absolute value being between two things, right? So we get minus delta is less than x minus p, no absolute value bears anymore, is less than delta. So, and we want to solve that for p itself. So maybe I'll even take the effort of negating everything. So negative delta is less than p minus x is less than delta. And so x minus <coughs> delta is less than p is less than x plus delta. Um, how many people are upset at that step? Is anyone? Yeah. Yeah, so everything's been multiplied by negative 1. Um, and maybe you're upset that it looks like minus delta stayed minus delta? Yeah. No. But really, like delta became minus delta. Do you have to do less than or equal to? Let's try to do less than, so it's still less than. Yeah, okay. Everyone happy again? Anyone still unhappy? I do not love this. Okay. I can't tell what other issues. <coughs> and now, like, we're basically done, right? If we want a lower bound on P, well, we have one. A is less than or equal to X. So, A minus delta is less than or equal to X minus delta is less than P. So, A minus delta is less than or equal to P. How do people feel? People feel okay? So what do we have now? We have that. Oops. We aren't at the end of the Now it's okay, right? Okay. So let's see. Since we have that A minus delta is less than or equal to P, for absolutely every choice of delta, it follows that A is less than or equal to P. All right, that uh, problem from like the very first homework that I assigned, maybe the second, um, was prove that if a minus delta is less than or equal, maybe the letters are different. If a is minus delta is less than or equal to p for absolutely every positive choice of delta, then a must be less than or equal to p. That's actually a really useful result, isn't it? We've used that like at least twice. Yeah, at least twice. Probably more. Um, so I, we have so many things that like just relax everything by a delta, 
but then since you've relaxed it by an arbitrarily small delta, you haven't really lost any information. And so p is in the interval from a to infinity. And thus, every limit point of a to infinity is in a to infinity. And so a to infinity is closed. People feel OK about that? Too? And it was really kind of just follow your nose, wasn't it? We use definitions of things, and that's kind of about it. Um, so those of you who are currently in the points of topology class will notice this as something very close to just the definition of what a topology is. So take the collection of closed sets in the real line. They satisfy the following properties. If x and y are closed sets, then so is their union. The union of two closed sets is still closed. If you take an arbitrary indexing set, blackboard all day, for every a, let's suppose that x sub alpha is a closed set. So I have a whole bunch of closed sets, maybe finitely many, maybe countably many, maybe uncountably many. Uh, doesn't matter. The intersection of all of those closed sets is still a closed set. And maybe just for those of you who could use the notational review, let's just think about what arbitrary intersection means. So you know what like, the intersection from n equals 1 to infinity of xn means? It means you want all of the things that are in xn for every natural number n. This, this notation means the same thing. All right, so for each natural number n, we take x sub n to be a set. Then the inter intersection just means all the things that are in each and every one of the, those sets. So instead, you could just write the intersection of all natural numbers n of x sub n and get the same result. The formal definition of, of arbitrary intersection is exactly what you think it should be from that point of view. The intersection, indexed by a bunch of alphas in a set A, of x alpha is the set of all x values such that x is in the set x sub alpha for absolutely every alpha. People feel OK? And that, I mean, that just allows for more freedom in what sorts of intersections you can do all at once. Um, so let's see, with five minutes, um, I think one of two things are doable. I can either prove that theorem or I can use that theorem to prove that the closed interval from A to B is closed. How many people would just like to see the proof of the theorem right now? How many people would like to see the proof that the closed interval from A to B is closed? OK. I think that once you just want to see the proof of the theorem in order, um, happen. So let's do it. Um, well, let's see. I don't think I even have time to prove both. So maybe I'll. But you have time to prove that the closed interval AB is closed. There will be time tomorrow. No, Monday. Yeah, it's short. I know. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so let's let x and y. So let, let's let's prove the false one. Let's prove that the union of two closed sets is closed. So let's let x and y both be closed sets, and p be a limit point of x union y. What does the limit the definition of limit point tell us? Every limit point is in x union y. That's what we need to show. So yeah, that's worth saying. Um, that p be a limit point of x union y, we must show p is in x union y. Right, that's what we want to show if we want to achieve closeness. So by the sequential reformulation of limit points, aha, we're going to make some use of that theorem. That, you know, since p is a limit point, we see there is a sequence Pn such that Pn is in x union y for all n in n. P sub n is not equal to P for all n. And P sub n converges to P. All right, that's the sequential reformulation of limit points which, if you like, is a good reason to call them limit points, right? A limit point is the limit of a sequence. 
So since Pn is in x union y for all n, then one of two things ha has to happen. Either Pn has to be in x infinitely many times, or Pn has to be in y infinitely many times. Possibly both. You guys buy that? Good. Uh, must either be that Pn is in x infinitely many times, or Pn is in y for infinitely many times. Whoa log, let's take Pn to be in x infinitely many times. Ah, so if Pn is in x for infinitely many n, let's just take the sub, the, the n sub k, which gives us the kth natural number for which P sub n sub k is in x. Right, whenever you have, see an infinite subset of the natural numbers, you have a subsequence. So let's form a subsequence, p sub n sub k, such that p sub n sub k is in x for every k in n. Notice now that p sub n sub k is a sequence satisfying, that p sub n sub k is in x. p sub n sub k is not equal to p. And p sub n sub k, what should p sub n sub k converge to? Wait, wait, what does that mean P is? Yeah, but that are. A limit point of X. So P is a limit point of X. What do we know about the set X? By assumption? That's true. Um, what did we what type of set was X? A closed set? So if P is a limit point of X, what do we know about P? It's an X. So P is a limit point of X. Since X is closed, by assumption, we get P is an element of X then. But, oh, yeah. But as Don pointed out, X is a subset of X union Y, and so we see that P is an X union Y. Does that prove that absolutely every limit point of X union Y is an X union Y? So X union Y is closed. I guess there's this step where we assumed that the sequence was in x infinitely many times. What do you think? Would it be the same proof if we'd taken y instead? Mm -hmm. So it really was with animals in general. Yeah. Um, and now I really am at time. We'll pick up on claim 2 next time. And it may seem like claim 2 might be the harder one because it has like an arbitrary intersection. But really, it'll be the easier one in that we won't need to take a substance. Um, and maybe as people are hacking, I'll tell you time off why the closed interval should be closed. It is now an intersection of a closed interval from negative infinity to B and a closed interval from negative infinity. So it's a closed interval. So it's an intersection of two closed sets instead of closed. There we go. Are both Mondays and Fridays? Um, Friday of last week, one of the days last week, I screwed up the recording. I pulled out the memory card before I hit stop recording, and so it destroyed the file. Um, why would it do that? Why would I do that? No, why would the recording probably destroy the file? Uh, because that's what happens when you pull out a memory card while it's still being written. Really? There's probably a way that I could have repaired it, but I don't know how, so I just deleted it. It's kind of, it's evil. It destroys it. Yeah. So the, the notes are online. You can come by my office and talk about it. Okay. Yeah. I just don't know why it would destroy something that you spent time making that video. Because it was still trying to make it. So it just gave up. It gave up on life.